Voices for Justice is a podcast that uses adult language and discusses sensitive and potentially triggering topics, including violence, abuse, and murder. This podcast may not be appropriate for younger audiences. All parties are innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Some names have been changed or omitted per their request or for safety purposes. Listener discretion is advised. My name is Sarah Turney, and this is Voices for Justice. Today, I'm discussing the case of missing Emma Filipov. Emma was 26 years old when she went missing from downtown Victoria, BC. She was last seen by two police officers who were asked to check on her well being. They found her at the Empress Hotel, barefoot, disoriented, and disheveled. Emma's family was aware that she'd been struggling. After receiving a ton of concerning phone calls from Emma, her mother, Shelley, insisted on flying across Canada to be by her side. But by the time she got to Victoria, just a few hours after Emma's encounter with the police, it was too late. Emma was gone. This is the disappearance of Emma Filipov. Emma Filipov was born on January 6, 1986 in Perth, Ontario. This is about an hour outside of Ottawa. Perth has been described as pretty tight-knit, and the town is on the smaller side, having just about 6,000 residents in 2016. Emma and her three siblings grew up in a house their parents built themselves. Her mother, Shelley, worked as a teacher, and her father, James, worked as a painter. It seems Emma very much took after her father creatively. She wasn't really like her other siblings who enjoyed playing sports and competing. In the documentary Finding Emma Philippaugh from the CBC, her father, James, explained that despite Emma excelling at most hobbies and extracurricular activities, she just really enjoyed trying new things. She danced, she wrote, she made art, and she excelled at all of it. But it seems like writing poetry is what ultimately stuck with her. The adjectives that kept coming up in my research about Emma are giving, kind, private, good-natured, and free spirit. It seems like Emma had a happy childhood for the most part. But like a lot of kids, she had a really rough time as a teenager when her parents separated. In the documentary, they share some of her writing from this time. Emma expresses sadness and frustration that her parents leaned on her emotionally during their separation, and she discusses how much it affected her. So when Emma's 18th birthday approaches, she makes plans to get away from all the turmoil at home and move out on her own. Obviously, it seems like Emma was trying to find herself, just like a lot of young people do. She experimented with a few different professions. She taught English in China, and she got degrees in photojournalism and culinary arts. By the age of 25, Emma moves to Victoria, British Columbia, and begins working at a fish and chip shop. Victoria is nestled right on the border of Washington in the U.S., and it's substantially larger than Perth, with about 92,000 residents in 2017. It seems like Emma's housing was a little sporadic in Victoria. On helpfindemma.com, they explain that Emma didn't have housing or a job lined up for when she got to Victoria. Her plan was basically to figure things out once she got there. When Emma did get to Victoria, she lived with a childhood friend for a few months, before eventually getting an apartment of her own in the same building. But not too long after, Emma's housing became much more unstable. She lived in a hotel where she worked cleaning rooms, she slept on friends' boats, in the woods, and even in a tree sometimes. Eventually, in 2012, Emma went to the Sandy Merriman's House Women's Shelter. She stayed for about a month at a time, from February to November when she went missing. During this time, Emma had stable employment at Redfish Bluefish, a popular seasonal restaurant at Inner Harbor in Victoria. But, like I said, it's a seasonal restaurant. It shuts down in the winter. So by November, Redfish Bluefish was closed, and Emma wasn't due back for work until February 2013. Emma did have a few thousand dollars in her bank account that would presumably cover most of her expenses until then, especially because it seems like Emma didn't really enjoy spending money. According to her family, she much preferred nature over city life. She liked walking barefoot, traveling, and nature. She didn't enjoy social media, cell phones, or, quote, playing any role in the establishment. By summer, Emma made some changes to her diet and habits. She stopped binge drinking, stopped smoking, stopped consuming coffee and sugar, and for the most part went entirely vegan. She also bought a van and made plans to travel the island while living in it but things didn't exactly go according to plan. 
By the end of summer, the van began breaking down a lot, and she had to have it towed several times. Now she seemed less sure of what her next move would be, and her outlook seemed less cheery. Her friends would describe her eating and social habits as monk-like, saying, quote, She began to distance herself from others, becoming fearful, withdrawn, and paranoid. Despite not knowing her exact next step in life, according to several people, Emma mentioned plans about moving away from Victoria. But the stories varied. Some said she was planning on sailing to Mexico and going to San Juan with a man she hardly knew. Others said she mentioned California, going to Japan with her father, Salt Spring Island, living off the grid in the woods, Tofino, and seeing an aunt in Lanceville. And we'll discuss this more later, but some even said Emma was ready to go home to Perth. On one hand, Emma seemed like a deeply introverted, creative young person who was just trying to figure out what she wanted for her life. She had absolutely nothing tying her down. I could see why she dreamed up so many scenarios and travel plans. But let's talk about what actually happens next. Because on the other hand, there's really no denying that Emma seemed to be going through some type of crisis. On Wednesday, November 21st, 2012, Emma hires a tow truck driver to pick her up from Sandy Merriman Shelter and drive her about an hour away to Souk to tow her van. This is important to note, because the driver would later tell police that during the drive, Emma talked about going home to Perth. She basically said she just couldn't wait to go home, where she could see the sun and the snow. Then, about two days later, around midnight on November 23rd, Emma calls her mom and tells her that she wants to come home. Now, this really took Shelly by surprise. Emma is extremely independent and private, and suddenly she's calling her mom around midnight, super anxious, and is telling her she wants to come home. Emma never tells Shelly exactly what's bothering her, but she takes the call very seriously and immediately books a plane ticket for Emma to fly home. But then, a few hours later, Emma calls back. She tells her mom that it's fine. She'll just stay where she is and figure things out. Now, of course, Shelly is still extremely worried, and she says that she could just tell something was wrong, but she does as Emma asks, and she cancels the flight. Later that night, Emma calls again. She tells her mom that she really does want to come home, but she's feeling overwhelmed. But this time, she asks if Shelly will fly out to Victoria, help her pack up all her stuff, and then they can fly back together. So, Shelly books another plane ticket. But then, again, Emma changes her mind. Shelly told the Victoria Times colonist that Emma seemed to really want to try to make the move on her own, so she was just trying to respect her wishes. Over about two days of conversations with her mom, Shelly finds out for the first time that Emma is living at a shelter, and she becomes increasingly concerned about her as she continues to change her mind about Shelly helping her make the move back to Perth. On Wednesday, November 28th, at 4.30 in the morning, Emma calls Shelly again, telling her not to come. Shelly tells Emma that she won't, but she's obviously extremely concerned at this point. So, she decides to fly out that afternoon to check on Emma anyway without telling her. So, Shelly grabs her bag, she travels to the airport, she goes on this extremely long flight to Victoria, and she gets to the women's shelter around 11pm. But Emma was already gone. After Shelly arrives in Victoria, she and the police begin investigating Emma's disappearance. When they visit the shelter Emma had been staying at, they learn that as Shelly feared, Emma's behavior was becoming more concerning in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. She'd become more erratic, depressed, and possibly suicidal. At one point, Emma reportedly moved all her furniture outside because she believed they were talking to her. She also threw away and donated many of her personal belongings. At one point, the shelter even calls the police over Emma's behavior. It appears that the shelter was told to call back if Emma continued this behavior or if it got worse, but a second call was never made. On November 29th, Emma's van is searched, and they find some really important belongings. They find her passport, her laptop, her journals, and her camera. It's not a good situation. But Shelley and the police do not believe foul play was involved at this point. They just think that she's likely going through something and is probably hiding somewhere. And the good news about Emma not having her passport is that they hope she couldn't have gone far, or at least not to the United States just across the way, which would obviously complicate the investigation. 
Shelly has made statements in several interviews that she believed it would just take some flyers and asking around about Emma to find her. Over the next few days, weeks, and months, huge search teams are formed to look for Emma. They search the immediate area, Vancouver Island, huge pieces of undeveloped land, they travel to the U.S., and dive team search Inner Harbor, right near the Redfish Bluefish restaurant where Emma was working. There was just no trace of Emma. But Shelley and the police were able to put together a really solid timeline of Emma's whereabouts leading up to her disappearance. So let's take a step back and go back to three days before Emma calls her mom, Tuesday, November 20th, 2012. That day, Emma visits her local YMCA to sign up for a membership. She's captured on surveillance, entering and exiting the building four times within 14 minutes. In the video, you can see her looking out the glass doors. To me, it looks like she could have been waiting for or hiding from someone. She definitely looks nervous or anxious. There's also been some debate about her hands in this video. Some people think that she's possibly holding a cell phone, while others think that she's just kind of nervously fidgeting with her hands. As far as I could find, no one has been able to definitively say if she was really holding something. The next day, the 21st, is the day her van gets towed again. I told you guys about this earlier. This is when Emma discusses going back home to Perth with the driver. Two days later, on Friday, November 23rd, Emma starts making the calls to her mom. On Sunday, the 25th, Emma's van has to be towed again, and she makes arrangements for it to be towed to the parking lot of the Chateau Victoria Hotel in Victoria. On Tuesday, the 27th, Emma gets a notice on her van from hotel staff, notifying her that she needs to move it. So obviously, this is a lot of stress for anyone. If you've ever had an unreliable vehicle, you know this pain. Car troubles can be extremely distressing, and paying money to have your broken vehicle towed versus being able to spend that money fixing it just isn't pleasant. It seems clear that Emma needed some type of break, and she was yearning to go back home to Perth. During these calls she made to her mom, Emma breaks down her walls of privacy and independence a bit. She finally breaks down and tells her mom that things aren't going as planned, and she's been staying at a women's shelter but she continues to have this debate with her mother and herself about whether she needs to or is willing to accept her mom's help. At 4.30 a.m. on Wednesday, November 28th, the day Emma goes missing, she tells her mom again not to come to Victoria. But Shelley, acting as I'd imagine a lot of moms would, says forget it, I'm going out there to check on my kid. And everything comes to a head. At 7 a.m., Emma goes to the Chateau Victoria Hotel and asks for one more day to move her van before they have it towed. They agree. At 8.23 a.m., surveillance video captures Emma at a 7-Eleven convenience store. Here, she uses her debit card to purchase a $200 prepaid credit card. She's carrying several bags with her, and like we saw at the YMCA, she's seen near the door looking out nervously, as if maybe she's looking for someone. At 10 a.m., Emma is seen on Pandora Street. Emma's friend Julian sees her and gets off the bus he was on to talk to her. But Julian can't really tell if it's Emma. Her back is turned to him, and she's wearing a big puffy coat and carrying a lot of bags. So he kind of just shakes it off and goes about his business without approaching her. But when he returns a short time later, he sees that the person is still there, and it's Emma. He goes up to her and asks what she's doing and if she needs some type of help. He says Emma just kind of shakes her head at him. He does stick around for a bit, but Emma won't talk to him, so he eventually just leaves. Now, I do feel like I need to pause here for a little note about this witness statement. In my research, I came across some articles that depict this guy as kind of a jealous ex-boyfriend, possibly somebody that Emma might have been romantically involved with, but then it just didn't work out. So although it appears that this interaction did happen according to him and the location seems valid, I might take Emma's response to him with a grain of salt. Now, there are a ton of people who have come forward to say that they saw Emma on this day. Sometime in the early afternoon, a former colleague of hers sees her near Our Place Soup Kitchen on Pandora Street. Emma says she isn't feeling well and can't talk. The colleague asks if Emma needs a hug and apparently she just gets this horrified look on her face and walks away. At 1 p.m., Emma is seen again on Pandora Street, but her clothes are different, and it looks like she just washed her hair. And there are more sightings that afternoon. 
two people report seeing Emma on Douglas Street, walking back and forth and looking extremely confused or lost. The witnesses say that they call 911, but we don't know if anyone followed up on that call. Another witness claims to have seen Emma in downtown Victoria with an older man, and there's a sighting of Emma at the Rock Bay shelter as well. At 5.54 p.m., Emma goes back to the 7-Eleven where she bought the prepaid credit card, and this time she purchases a prepaid cell phone. Once again, she's seen on surveillance near the doors, looking nervous and looking out. By 6 p.m., Emma is back at the Sandy Merriman shelter. Here, she's told by a staff member that her mother is coming to Victoria. This staff member says that it seems like Emma was torn between feeling relieved that her mom was coming and very anxious about it, which honestly seems to fit right along with her bouncing back and forth with Shelly. But ultimately, Emma apparently gets really upset, storms out the door, and walks away. At 6.10 p.m., Emma is picked up by a taxi cab somewhere near the shelter. At first, she asks him to drive her to the airport, but when she asks about how much the trip will cost, she says she can't afford the $60 fare and gets dropped off where she was picked up. Now, what's really perplexed people about this specific detail of the case is that Emma had a few thousand dollars in her bank account at this time. She could have easily afforded the cab fare, and likely some type of plane ticket but for some reason, she changes her mind. Just minutes later, around 6.15 p.m., Emma is seen by an acquaintance of hers named Dennis. Dennis says he sees Emma barefoot on a street corner, looking confused and disheveled, so he approaches her. He asks if everything's okay. Is she looking for someone? Is someone following her? But he says Emma doesn't say much. She just keeps looking around. Now, unlike any other encounters thus far, he says Emma does ask him to walk with her, but he says that soon she becomes upset by his questions and says she'd rather walk alone. At this point, Dennis is concerned, so he goes into a restaurant in the area, calls the police, and waits for them to come to Emma before leaving. At 7.17pm, police approach Emma. She's by the Empress Hotel on Government Street. She's barefoot, but holding her shoes. Two officers speak with her for 45 minutes, but they report that Emma didn't really talk with them. It took 30 minutes just for her to say anything. She basically just nodded at their questions and gave very short answers. She also refused to put her shoes back on. Ultimately, we don't have any audio, video, or a transcript of this conversation, so it's hard to say exactly what happened here. But after 45 minutes, the police leave. They say Emma is not a threat to herself or anyone else. Four hours later, Emma is reported missing. Through all the searches and all the interviews, police really don't get an idea of where Emma could have gone. But then, in December, they get a huge lead when that prepaid credit card Emma purchased is finally used. One of the biggest leads in this case comes on December 5th, 2012. This is when that prepaid credit card Emma purchased is finally activated and used. At 11.17 a.m., the card was swiped to purchase a carton of cigarettes at a Petro gas station on Suic Road. Of course, the police are all over this, but unfortunately, it's not Emma. They do find the guy that used the card and bring him in for questioning. They think he has to know something. The man explains that he found the card still sealed on the side of the road in Callwood, B.C., now, by car, this is about 25 minutes from Victoria, so not extremely far away from where Emma was last seen at this point, but it's also a three-hour walk. In the end, it doesn't seem that the police believe this man was nefariously involved in Emma's disappearance, and his participation in the case appears to end here. But now we know that Emma's car somehow got eight miles or about 13 kilometers away from the Empress Hotel. After searching the harbor in January, the police tell the media that they've basically hit a wall. They've exhausted their leads and ideas of where to search. Shelley stayed in Victoria for two months searching for Emma. She stayed at a hotel so close to the shelter Emma was last staying at that she could see it from her window. She participated in the searches, hung flyers, and begged everyone to be on the lookout for anyone with an orange purse like Emma's, hoping it would be something super easy for people to recognize. But when Emma didn't return to work as scheduled in February, Shelley returned home to continue her work from there. She told the Victoria Times colonist, quote, I don't want to because it feels like I'm leaving her behind, but my other kids need me too. It's time. 
Then, as these things go, weeks turn to months, turn to years. There are more searches, more flyers, and more investigating, but not much happens until May 2014. This is when a man in Gastown, BC is seen on surveillance video at a clothing store. He's holding Emma's missing poster, but it's crumpled in his hand. He says that Emma is his girlfriend, and she's not missing. She ran away from her parents and just wants to be left alone. Now, I have to give a huge shout out to the workers at that store for noticing and more importantly, reporting this behavior. They keep the video, call the police, and tell them everything they remember. But despite having video of this man, police are unable to locate him privately, so they go to the media. And people run wild with this story. Everyone's wondering if this man could be connected. Is he really romantically involved with Emma? Has he been hiding her this entire time? Is he holding her captive? Unfortunately, this does absolutely nothing to clear up the question of whether Emma left on her own accord and is staying away by choice, because this man has never been located for questioning. This part of Emma's case really blew my mind. Although the photos we have of this man aren't the best, because let's face it, surveillance video is notoriously kind of the worst, we do have a lot of distinguishing information about this guy. He has a lighter complexion, he's about six foot tall, he's in his 30s, so maybe 40s now, his left knee and foot are turned inward, and he walks with kind of a limp or a sway according to descriptions. He has dark hair, and he has tattoos on both of his forearms that are possibly flames. This isn't just your generic white male, possibly 20s with a blurry face description. There's some solid information here. Yet this man, and no one who knows this man, has ever come forward. I will, of course, have this photo posted on my website and social media for you to share. Now, in 2015 and 2016, Emma's mother and brother get into some legal trouble. Long story short, her brother was arrested for selling drugs. And while Emma's mother was accused of helping him, all charges against her were dropped. Essentially, it appears that Emma's brother was storing items in his mom's house without her knowledge so Shelly ultimately faces no charges. Some have speculated that this could somehow be tied to Emma's case, but as far as I found, there's nothing to say that these arrests have anything to do with Emma going missing, so I'm gonna leave it at that. Despite this going wild in the media and overshadowing Emma's case for a bit, Shelly continues advocating for her daughter. By 2016, the Help Find Emma Philippoff Facebook page has 10,000 followers, and Emma has an entire team behind her trying to find her. But in 2016, we also get another piece to this puzzle. Shelly gets a call from a man who believes he saw Emma at midnight on the night she went missing. She was standing across from the Empress Hotel. He recalls that orange purse that Shelly implored people to look out for. He told Shelly he regretted not coming forward sooner. He just didn't think that his sighting was a big deal. But once he saw all the media coverage surrounding the fourth anniversary, he felt compelled to finally come forward. It's not a huge tip, but it helps place Emma in the same area hours after she was previously last known to be seen. It's also a show of faith that Shelley's cries for witnesses to come forward is working. In 2017, for the fifth anniversary of Emma going missing, dozens of vigils were held across Canada and the world. It seemed like everyone was looking for Emma, but no one could find her, or any clue of where she may have gone. And then, in June 2018, Emma's case gets another huge media resurgence, as Shelley makes a daunting discovery. Emma wasn't last seen at the Empress Hotel. Instead, she was miles away. About nine hours after Emma Filipoff speaks to Victoria Police at 5 a.m. on November 29th, a man only known as William is driving to work. He sees Emma on the side of the road. She appears to be in distress. He says she's kind of leaping from the sidewalk to the street, and she screams a few times. He says at one point she looks past his car and screams again, so he looks back to see what she could be screaming at, and there was nothing there. He adds that Emma was soaking wet, she wasn't wearing shoes, and it looked like she was walking for a long time. Her feet were obviously hurting her. He says it looked like she was walking on coals, but her eyes were clear. She didn't appear to be under the influence of anything. This man does pull over and Emma gets in the car. 
This is around 1264 Equimalt Road in Victoria, about three miles or five kilometers west of the Empress Hotel on Government Street, where she was last known to be seen at this point. He says when she gets into the car, he asks if everything is okay. And Emma kind of blows it off and says, oh, it's just my dad. From here, Emma asks if he could drive her to Colwood to visit a female friend. Now, this man says that he really can't be late for work, so he can't take her all the way, but he can get her closer. He drives Emma for about five minutes before dropping her off next to a 24-hour gas station at the intersection of Craigflower and Admirals. In the podcast, The Search for Emma Philippoff by Kimberly Bordage, this man says that once Emma got into the car, she became really calm. She wasn't looking around for anyone anymore. She just totally changed in demeanor. It's a short car ride, but he tells Bordage what he remembers. He says once Emma got out of the car again, she began acting erratically again. She kind of began running back and forth in the street, and then started walking toward Callwood. He says this is the last he saw of her before heading off to work. He had no idea who the woman was until he was made aware of Emma Filipov going missing nearly six years later. When he realizes who the woman is, he calls the Victoria Police Department, but they direct him to Crime Stoppers. And you guys, no one followed up. So this kind man, this wonderful soul, reaches out to Shelley and says, Hey, I'm pretty sure I was the last person to see your daughter but no one's following up with me. I can't even imagine the frustration Shelley must have felt having to field this phone call herself. But this revelation led to a three-day search of the area. Unfortunately, nothing was found. Despite the search not turning up any new clues, this is still a huge revelation for Emma's case. We obviously don't know where Emma went from here, but it gets us one step closer to finding the next clue. It also gives us a much better idea of how that prepaid credit card got to Colwood. And that's pretty much where the case is today. Emma's case is still active, and as we approach the 10-year anniversary, I can only hope that the renewed media attention leads us to the next clue, just one step closer to finding Emma. Now, before I touch on theories, I do want to acknowledge the amazing work of Kimberly Bordage. As far as I can tell, she appears to be a huge driving force for Emma's case, and a true advocate for her family. She created the Search for Emma Philippoff podcast, where she interviews the man who last saw Emma. That's where I got a lot of those details about that encounter. I also want to give a huge shout out to Jordan Bonaparte from the Nighttime Podcast and Emma Philippoff is Missing podcast. Shelley Philippoff has praised him for his coverage, and for keeping Emma's story in the media. So if you are looking for a deep dive into Emma's case, I definitely recommend checking out his work as it is greatly praised by Shelley. Last but not least, I want to acknowledge how incredible the website Help Find Emma Filipoff is. It's where I was able to sort out a lot of the discrepancies I found online. And it's just a wealth of knowledge if you're looking for information directly from Emma's team. Now onto theories and loose ends. This case is one that can leave you speculating almost endlessly. Emma's prepaid cell phone was never activated. Now, we know Emma didn't really care about material possessions, but some of her most prized items that she used to express herself creatively were left behind. Her journal, her laptop, and her camera. We know these things were important to her and her lifestyle. She also left behind her passport, making it much more difficult for her to travel outside of Canada. Her bank accounts were never used, despite having thousands of dollars in there. And we know that she obviously never used that prepaid credit card. While it really does seem that Emma was searching for a different way of life and obviously going through some type of crisis, it seems unlikely that she started a new life unless she had some help. Is it possible the man claiming to be her boyfriend was telling the truth? That Emma is alive and well and with this man? Maybe. I think this is just one of those cases where you can argue a lot of different scenarios. Foul play, a willful disappearance, an accident, Emma completing suicide. They all seem possible. I think you could spend hours talking through different possible scenarios. But I think you guys know what I'm going to say. The bottom line is, whatever happened to Emma, she needs to be found. And like I said, as we approach the 10-year anniversary of her disappearance, I hope it sparks more leads and witnesses to come forward. It certainly has in the past. 
In a story by the Victoria Times colonist about the fourth anniversary of Emma going missing, I found a quote from police spokeswoman Bowen Osco. Quote, The quality of a tip isn't as relevant as what it leads to. Often in missing person files, it is distinct aspects of that missing person, whether it be a physical feature, mannerism, or character trait that makes them stand out, which allows us to locate them. In this case, going missing is out of the ordinary for Emma, as is her behavior in the hours leading up to her being reported missing, end quote. Which brings me right to our call to action. Emma's case is one that continues to get leads and tips that are slowly but surely shaping what we know about her going missing. Please continue to share her story. Even cases like Emma's that have been huge in the media need your help. I also really think that if we can figure out who that man is that claimed to be Emma's boyfriend, we could find another huge piece to this puzzle, or at least just exhaust that possibility. So please check out my website and my social media to share this man's photo. Someone has to know who this guy is. Every little piece to this puzzle gets us one step closer to finding out what happened to Emma. As a reminder... 26-year-old Emma Filipoff was last seen at the intersection of Craig Flower and Admirals in Victoria. It's believed she was on her way to Colwood. Emma is white, 5 feet 5 inches tall with brown hair and brown eyes. She has no tattoos, and she was last believed to weigh between 90 and 110 pounds. As of recording this episode, she would now be in her late 30s. There is a $25,000 reward for information leading to Emma's recovery. Anyone with information is asked to call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477 or the Victoria Police non-emergency number at 250-995-7654. If for some reason you submit a tip and they do not follow up, please use the contact form on helpfindemmafilipoff.com to get in touch with her family. But as always, thank you, I love you, and I'll talk to you next time. Voices for Justice is hosted and produced by me, Sarah Turney, and is a Voices for Justice media original. This episode contains research assistance by Daniel McGinnis. If you love what we do here, please don't forget to follow, rate, and review the show in your podcast player. It's an easy and free way to help us and help more people find these cases in need of justice. You can also support what we do here over on Patreon at patreon.com slash voices for justice. And for even more content, check out my other podcast, Disappearances, only on Spotify. <laughs>